Today on Lockdown Red Wings, we recap the final game of the Prospects Tournament, as well as go over possible contracts that the Red Wings could hand to Dylan Larkin. You're Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for WWJ News Radio 950. Well, Scotty is the host over at Locked On Tigers as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. Scotty, we don't got to get into it because I know you have your own show in which you'll break it down fully, but an ex- for once, an exciting day for you over at Locked On Tigers. Yeah, it's, I, it's probably the most exciting day at Locked On Tigers since we got rid of the last GM. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's a big day. Um, yeah, optically is uh, lo- looks pretty nice so far, and uh, yeah, it, it'll be fun to talk about for sure. Because you know, like you said, we haven't had too much fun to talk about over there. But just, I mean, it's a it's a good hire today as of today you know time will tell with with these things gms are, are really hard to, to to grade until they start doing things but a, as of today i mean hard, hard to look at it and not be a little excited so also hey tuesday episode as we're back to five episodes a week so uh yeah haven't done a tuesday show in day. a minute it's been yeah, it's definitely been a minute. Uh, we got the final game of the Red Wings prospect tournament. We're gonna get to that here first in the first segment, and maybe a little bit into the second segment, and then uh, we're gonna finish it out with talking about Dylan Larkin's contract situation. He was on Thirty Two Thoughts with Jeff Merrick and Elliot Friedman, and they talked a little bit about uh, his contract situation. His negotiations are ongoing, so we'll talk a little bit about what kind of contract the captain could be looking at. But again, first. Let's go back, Scotty, to the final prospects tournament game that happened. Well, by the time people are listening to this on Monday, uh, September 19th, and the Red Wings beat the Toronto Maple Leafs prospects team uh, four to one. So they finished the prospects tournament two and one, which, again, doesn't mean anything because these are just exhibition games. But still nice to see the Red Wings were outshot in this game, 23 to 17. And I, I think I think, again, Scotty, you know, a lot of players stood out, but I think no one stood out more in these three games than Sebastian Kosa and Jan Bednar because they were on their top top game, top form, all three of these games. Obviously, Kosa had the second game off, but Bednar especially in all three games. For sure. No, I, I, I think that they each played two, I, I think, right? I think Bednar didn't play game one, right? You're right. You're right. My bad. So well, it was... Um... No, they, they they both looked great, and I, I was really pumped to see that. Like this was the most exciting for me because, like, I, I I really like Bednar, and Kosa is obviously the future of of the goalie position, hopefully within the organization. So, seeing the ha- that handoff specifically, and not having to wait two different days to see each each player getting them both in one game was super cool. Kosa looked fantastic. Uh, he, he looked really sharp, and uh, yeah, Bednar continues to impress. And again, we, we've said it on yesterday's show, but this is a an organization more than a lot that, that understand, especially after the last two years, really understand how important goalie depth can be in the middle of a season. So uh, wh- no matter what you believe the ceiling of Bednar is, doesn't really matter to me at this point. He He's hopefully going to provide some pretty solid organizational depth. And that's really all you can ask. And then Kosa, I think is uh, playing for, you know, tr- trying to get some legitimate playing time in Grand Rapids, which I think is the assumption anyway. So uh, super cool all around the board. And yeah, they both looked really good in this one. Uh, yeah. Jan Bednar made seven or six saves on seven shots. Well, Sebastian Kosa made 16 saves on all 16 shots. They both split the game evenly. Um, going to the players, the positional players, Scotty, who stood out to you in this game? Uh, well, I think like we, we can just talk about like Edvinson again, just cause we should probably talk about him individually in every game. But I, I think the biggest thing for me was Soderblom in, in this one looked really solid yet again. Uh, this was the second game in a row that I, I thought he looked really sharp without the first game. Maybe we, we talked about it on yesterday's show in game one, 
maybe not as not as much, but in the last two games, really looked solid. And yeah, there, there's like Cross Hannis was was fantastic again. I'm loving Cross Hannis. Like that that continues to be one of the biggest stories of this tournament is just how good he looked. And then Max Boltman, I think it was, put out a little teaser where he talked about the possibility of a Hannis and Soderblom line in Grand Rapids at some point this year. So I, I think that that kind of riled people up after seeing how good both of them looked in, in this tournament. Absolutely. Soderblom, like you said, was great again. I think he looked very solid throughout he, the entire he knows tournament. He's big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, big. It's, it's fun. like, there's so many players that, that don't, right? Like, there's so many players that don't know how to correctly, I guess, or are still working on how to utilize their size. And I'm not saying he's a master at and then you know is NHL ready today but he he certainly knows that he's bigger than you and and knows how to utilize that and it's really fun to watch yeah well <laughs> what's crazy about that cross Hannes Soderblom's connection too is like there's somebody that's getting left out of that connection and that is Simon Edvinson because yeah. cross Hannes had another goal today again assisted by Soderblom but on both those goals Simon Edvinson also had an assist today or on Monday's game it was a primary on Sunday's game, it was uh, or Saturday's game. Saturday's game, it was a secondary. Saturday's assist. was the secondary. Yeah. yeah, that's right. They didn't play on Sunday. Thank you. Get my days mixed up. So, and that's things we like. We talked about Edvinson and how he kind of like looked. Maybe he was a little bit laissez faire out there on the ice, but he was still being effective despite maybe looking like he was casual. Like he was still getting He's points. really good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's kind of crazy that the ice shrinks. And that just makes it easier for him to cover more ground with his strides. Like he looked like he was taking half strides out there and he was still beating guys to box. It's just, I, I he just has an enormous amount of, well, just built in good genetics with his height, but good athlete, uh, n- natural athleticism as well. So they, he looked good. Uh, Soderblom looked good. And obviously cross Hannes looked good again, cross Hannes with another goal. So it's really just, it feels like a repeat of yesterday's episode and like the same guys, showed up and played well again. Uh, and you, had, you also had goals from Martin Mitchell. You had a goal from Emil Vero, which is nice to see. And then Riley Piercy uh, got the empty net goal right at the end there, which is nice to see as he finishes out the prospects tournament with five goals in three games. <laughs> I mean, bad. hell, just throw him, a, throw him a minor league contract. See what he can do. Yeah, see what happens, man. I mean, that's that's the beauty of, of this tournament is just seeing – what can come out of it and what opportunities can arise for some of these players. So I think that'll be something that's cool to keep an eye on here. Probably pretty shortly after we're recording this a few hours after the final game ends, but I would imagine pretty quickly here, you'll start seeing some organizational moves. If they decide to go in a certain direction with any of these players, I'd imagine they'd, they'd happen, you know, not the NHL guys like Edmondson, they're going to wait till, whatever the the very end of of the preseason and whatnot to make that decision but for the organizational depth guys and kind of the the dudes that are lower down on the ladder you'll probably start seeing some uh whatever promotions signings contracts etc all kind of handed out relatively soon here let's go back also i want to give emil vero a little bit more credit he was a plus three in this game he was was yeah he looked really only guy yeah he was in the right spots at the right time i really liked him mitchell martin had three penalties in this game, which is really funny. Yes, he, he a, did. Hooking, slashing, and fighting penalty, which is great. Beauty. Great. Love that. that that's, a, that's, a, that's a Scotty kind of guy right that is, there. <laughs> is. That's a, that's a Scotty Bentley uh, type of player right there, let me tell you. Um, I do want to talk more about Simon Edmondson because there was a tweet that came out. Chris Draper had uh, said something interesting about what Simon Edmondson does when he has bad games. And I want to talk about it because, oh, I wish I could do this when I have a bad game. But we're not all so lucky. But before I get to that, I do have to talk to you guys today about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Find all the latest football league developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including this year's opening week's games. BetOnline is also your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. BetOnline, where the game starts. Segment two, Locked On Red Wings podcast. Scotty, uh, let's talk about Simon Edison a little bit more here. 
And that Chris Draper said that when Simon Edmondson has a bad game, he immediately calls either Nicholas Cronwall or Nicholas Lidstrom to go over game tape. Can we just take a second to not only like, am I hella envious of that? Absolutely. But that is an incredible resource to have at your fingertips when you're already a highly touted prospect, sixth overall, and you're huge and you have all this athleticism and all the skill to then be able to go, let me call Nicholas Lidstrom, arguably the best defensive defenseman to have Not ever arguably. played the game. Arguably one of the best defensemen, but definitely the best defensive defenseman to have ever played the game. And then also call up Nick Cronwall, who spent over 10 years in the NHL and was a number one defenseman on this team once Nick Lidstrom retired, who was also a solid player on this team, and ask them for advice and to go over tape with you. That is an insane resource to have. And it makes me, honestly, it makes me even more excited. And again, we're not, I don't, I don't want to overhype myself. I don't want to overhype Simon Evanson. And I don't want to look too far into things, but that's exciting to like have that ability. Like that makes it all the more interest, not interesting, all the more exciting for Simon Evanson that he has that kind of help to help him develop into a bona fide NHL defenseman. Yeah, it's something that 31 other teams can't offer a kid. Right. Right? <laughs> like that's that that's what makes that exciting, man. Like that's that's something that that 31 other organizations top to bottom do not have at their fingertips. You cannot call the greatest defenseman of all time when you have a bad game. If you, I mean, I guess I guess you could, but like, you know what I mean? Like that's something that that is that is so cool about the fact that so many players from the dominant Red Wings teams of the past stick around and are very prominent parts of the organization today because that's such a unique resource and, and such a awesome thing to be able to say that that we have and again 31 other teams don't it, it's it's very cool and I I, I Honestly, I can't wait for the preseason. Like, I, I just I want games to start. I want to be able to look at Simon Edmondson out on the ice. I want to see what he has to offer. I, I'm 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 ready to watch some some wing wheel hockey, baby. I'm just I'm ready to watch some some dudes on the ice, and and I want to start having those conversations about oh, you like is he ready to make the NHL roster? What are you seeing from him specifically that you like? What do you think he still needs to work on? Like, is there a roster spot for him? I want it. I want it so bad. I know we're very close. We're kind of knocking out the door of that. But, yeah, conversations like that just, just amp you up. I think it's impossible not to. And, and obviously, just aside, great resource to have. Like, very yeah. – can't hurt, right? Like, <laughs> can't hurt the kid, so – well, and I remember when they hired Nicholas Lidstrom, I was a little, there was a part of me that was a little worried about it. It's like the formation of an old boys club, which can be detrimental to organizations when you hire all your friends, regardless of their, you know, ability in the front office role. And I, it was definitely like an, un, it was an unfounded fear. Like I can own up to that. I understand that, you know, but because of Steve Eisman's like kind of lack of wanting to say exactly what his, Lidstrom's defined role is. I got a little nervous, but you look at everybody that Eisman has hired that has played for the Detroit Red Wings at some point or has already been with the organization. I mean, obviously Dan Cleary as one of like what the director of player development or something like that along those lines, playing with all those young kids has been great. Chris Draper as the director of amateur scouting has been great. I mean, these guys have been, they've come in, post NHL career and they've been able to apply their knowledge. They're very intelligent players. And like, I feel foolish having ever doubted anything in that regard. It was definitely an unfounded fear, but you know, I was nervous about Lidstrom because he had an undefined role. His role wasn't defined, right. but his role is undefined because he's just here to help the players. Like, how is it going to hurt you to have the best defenseman to have ever played the game in your organization to help, mentored the new young kids and yeah he's mo mostly staying in sweden but where are most of our defensemen coming from exactly i mean <laughs> william wallander you had uh mort cider was over there for a year you had simon you have simon edvinson so all your guys are coming from sweden or playing in sweden it's a hell of a resource to have for those kids before they make the jump to north america Absolutely. Yeah. Cannot be stressed enough how, how cool of a, just anytime stories like that come out, it's awesome. So I'm, I'm, I, I stay ready, baby. I'm so pumped. <laughs> um, well, 
let's move on then onto our next topic. Uh, Dylan Larkin, the 32 Thoughts, which is uh, Jeff we, Merrick. Before, Go ahead. Real quick, I know this is totally off script. Lucas Raymond, 84 overall, released for Chell. How are you feeling? First hit. I think it's fine. I think it's fair. Yeah. He had a really explosive first I think, half I mean, of the season. It's solid. Yeah. It's, it's a solid fair. rating, right? The question is, is so Pe- Zegers was what, 86? I think so. Where's Cider going to be ranked? That's the question. 98. <laughs> <laughs> that would be something. If he, I, if he's not, I mean, he should be better than 86. Well, if he, I mean, he's, what, in my like book, he needs to be at least an 86. Already? I don't think they'll make him a 90 yet. I think he, I don't think so either. I think I think when the game comes out, I'm going 88. Hmm. I'd be if as long as he keeps pace with Zegers, I would be so mad. You because think he's going to be the highest rated player on the team on the Red Wings? Yeah. Oh man, that is a good question. I could see Larkin being ranked the highest on the Larkin team. Larkin will be around a 90. But like yeah. Snyder might already be around at high me. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. Yeah, I mean, I it's one of those two. There's no one else that I think is really in, yeah. in competition for that that title. I think, but I think it very well could be. I think Burt might be nice. Burt might be an 87, 88. Yeah, Burt had a, I mean, after yeah, the season he had, year, he yeah. it. Yeah. But I, I just like, they're, you know, they're starting to roll out ratings and stuff. And I, I really liked the 84. I thought that that was fair. I thought it was pretty accurate. And anything there in the, in the mid-80s, I, I would have been... Uh, pretty happy with and anything like 85 or over I would have been like oh that's like surprisingly cool so I'm I'm very I, I just like I saw it literally right before we got on air and just wanted to know fair and accurate is not terms you uh, hear often when talking about EA Sports's NHL huh. franchise it's one player <laughs> that's one play you don't use that one very play. often with those guys uh, Dylan Larkin speaking to him uh, Jeff Merrick and Elliot Friedman on their 32 thoughts pro- podcast uh, their media availability in Vegas they spoke to Larkin and Larkin said uh, that negotiations are ongoing with Steve Eisman and he that he wants to stay in Michigan. And I believe every word of that, because why wouldn't a guy who was born in Michigan, raised in Michigan, played for the University of Michigan, not and is captain of the Detroit Red Wings, not want to stay? So I I'm have no worries in my mind that that extension is not going to happen. I think that extension is absolutely 100% going to happen. My question is, is what will that contract look like? And, uh, Scotty, I think I'm just going to open the floor to you first, man. Like, wh- when it comes to Dylan Larkin, he's coming off, for context, he's coming off a five-year contract with a 6.1 AAV. He's obviously going to get a pay upgrade. That was a pretty – that was a friendly contract he was on already. What do you think his new contract is going to look like? Yeah, well, I, I think they're going to give him as many years as both sides are comfortable. Like, I don't think – this is certainly not going to be, uh, you know – a bridge deal per se. There's nothing to bridge no. to. Like this is this is what this is this is what we're bridging to. This is the big deal. So I think honestly it would not shock me at all if they just gave him the full eight. Like that that really would not surprise me at all. I, I'm not sure it's a guarantee. I'm not gonna say that he's guaranteed eight, but it would not shock me whatsoever if he got eight. I think he's at least getting six. I, I mean I, I don't I don't see them going like three or four years either. I, I think that this has long-term, long-term again, like this is what the the bridge deal leads to is the long-term deal. And that's where we are. So uh, years wise, I, I expect a lot, which I'm totally cool with dudes. What? 25, 26 still. And is 26. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, he's <laughs> the captain of the team. Let, let's keep him around for as long as possible. And I think the much more fascinating conversation is with the money, because I think most people are kind of on board that they can and will and should give him a lot of years. But just looking at other contracts that have been given out lately, I think I want to go with around nine AAV. I think I want to go around nine and then maybe like give or take a quarter of a mil on either side. So like somewhere between eight, seven, five and nine, two, five. I think that's kind of where my head is at for the money. I I don't think he will get 10. And I also think he'll get more than eight and a half. So that's kind of where my, my thought is at my floor and ceiling are those two, but I think, I'm more in the range of somewhere around nine. I, well, 
before I say I agree or disagree with you, why don't we stop and take a quick break? And when we idea. come back, I'll give you my opinion on what Dylan Larkin's uh, contract going to look like. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Yeah, I agree 100%, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is the captain of the Detroit Red Wings. He, why wouldn't you want to sign him to a max length, max length contract if you're Steve Eisman? Because then you cut out the risk of having to pay him even more to keep him around longer. So he's 26 now. You give him eight years. That'll take him to his age 34 season, the end of his age 34 season. I mean, it just makes, it just carries him through his prime. You don't want to have to pay him again and give him another long-term contract when he's 30 or 32. Right. Pay him eight years now, and then I, I agree with you. I think somewhere, I think between eight point five and nine million is fair. Uh, he's not a UFA, but I mean, he is your captain, so maybe you want to throw him. I don't know. It, it, there, there's a range. Like he could take a team friendly deal. Nathan McKinnon did it. Nathan McKinnon's going to get probably going to become the richest player in the NHL this off season um, at some point when he signs his contract extension. But he could take a team friendly deal like Nathan McKinnon did this last time around. He could not. Um, but I don't think he's, I'd be surprised if he got more than $10 million a year. Cause when you look at the players who are getting more than $10 million a year, you got Anze Kopitar, you got Jonathan Taze, John Tavares, Leon Dreisaitl, Austin Matthews, and Connor McDavid. And Larkin's production just hasn't really matched those players. Um, so I just, I, I would be surprised to see him get that much money. But when you take him down to, you know, that beneath that $10 million mark, you got Tyler Sagan at 9.85, Braden point at 9.5, Nicholas Backstrom, 9.2 Crosby at 8.7, but he signed a 12 year contract when he was 24. So that contract's old. That, He's been, that, that was, that's a, you remember when he signed that thing? I was, a yeah, I was deal. like, I was like, people, people were looking around like in hockey, eight point eight point seven in hockey. Like people were freaking out. Yeah. I, that thing, that thing was crazy. Yeah. Steven Stamkos is only making eight point five, which is also like a pretty friendly deal when you think about it. Well, he's been there um, forever too. But. Well, he his his, well, his extension wasn't that long ago, was it? The extension wasn't too too long ago, but I'm just saying, you know, if you yeah. want to stay somewhere, a little team friendly kind of makes sense. That's but yeah, Philip Forsberg, Philip Forsberg, not Borg, uh, Mika Zabinajad, and hey, Tim Stutzel and Thomas Hurdle. All making north of eight million dollars, so I think between eight point five and nine nine point five is probably reasonable and what you should expect per year. I mean, this is just my opinion. So kind of a kind of a half like looking at the facts, half gut check on that one. Sure. But is there a, is there a reality that you think that he could take less than eight years? Like he would want less than eight years, or the Eisman would want less than eight years? I, I don't know if there is, but is there? Um. Like I said, it, it wouldn't be the most shocking thing in the world if if they announced a six. Like I, I'm not saying they're gonna they're guaranteed like they need to max him out and they're going to or whatnot. It you know at 26, you know six years put him to him at 32. That's still most people's prime ish, right? Like if you do eight, that takes you to 34. That's usually on the back end of it, but you're under contract through that, right? And and if you're still playing good hockey at 32, that kind of prevents that. If, you know, 32 to 34 is just a weird, like, age in hockey. That's where yeah. some people maintain, some people fall off. Like, that's right in that kind of gray area of what to expect going forward. So, I, 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 I'm not hard set on the fact that he's going to get eight. Um, but I can say I would be shocked if he got less than five. I, I I would five or less for that matter. If he got less than six, I would be I would be pretty surprised. I think six is is probably the floor there. Five, mm, uh, maybe maybe five is like the absolute I, floor. I cannot but see five. I I I I really can't either. And like I, I definitely don't see anywhere you know, on under those numbers either. So I don't know from Iserman's perspective. I mean, like, like I said, 32 to 34 is just such a weird gray area. There's no point in going from age, whatever, like 26 to 29 or like 26 to 40, like that, you know, three, four year deal just seems kind of pointless. So I don't think that it's, if you see less than eight, I wouldn't expect short term necessarily, but I mean, there's something to be said for for 
will take you to six and kind of reevaluate there and see how you're still playing out in your early 30s versus waiting until your mid 30s, right? Like that's a pretty clear distinction there. I don't know. I, I guess I go back and forth, but yeah, it, it's weird that the drop off is right in that 32, 33, 34 year old age range because that's, a, like I said, a really, really a gray area when it comes to handing out contracts in the history of the NHL. So my next question then would be, I, I mean, looking at the movement clauses, does he get a full no movement clause, full no trade clause, modified no trade clause? What do you think? Because on this current contract, he only has a full no trade clause this season, like this final year of his current contract. He, he finally is in, in a no trade clause. Yeah, I I mean, I, I guess I would be kind of surprised if there wasn't. I Honestly, I, I kind of expect full no movement just because like what – like, what are we doing here? Like, what <laughs> is, is Larkin ever really going to be on the trade block? And especially if you don't go eight, if you go eight, maybe they're like, Hey, you know, the last couple of years, if this, whatever, but, but even then, like we're, we're heading toward a direction where a sustained success is the goal. And B, if there is, even if it's not sustained, like what we're going to have a, like a three year window of being good, right? Like, yeah, like I, I don't think that's a really even possible at this point, but B, I, I'm not sure that's that's really in the plans or the expectation. So, yeah, I, I, I don't really see a purpose in the only reason you wouldn't is if you would believe at the end of the contract, you'd be looking to like enter another rebuild potentially, which I can't imagine. They're like, oh, yeah, like. Here's our eight-year plan, and after that, we're going right back to where we are right now. I don't, I don't think that's really what they're trying to build here. So yeah, I don't, I don't really see a, a purpose in in not doing so. Like you can move him to the second line if you think you need a a, a better one C. That's obviously a hot debate, like pretty much every season. Uh, you know, if you if you need a a better one C than Larkin to win a chip or whatnot, like that that's all great, but that's still you can have him still be on the team and and be the two C and the captain still. So yeah, I I don't really see a purpose in not doing it. No, I agree. I mean, it's gonna be it's this is harder to predict uh and what kind of clause he's gonna get. I think he's gonna absolutely get at least a full no trade clause, but the the thing is is like this can be different year after year. So he could start off with like a modified no trade clause, and then in the last few years goes full no trade clause, or it could be reversed. Right. So I mean that all comes down to the players between the player and the general manager. But I, I there's no doubt that there's going to be a no trade clause involved. There's no way he gets an eight year contract with no no trade clause or no no For movement sure. clause. But yeah, I mean that's that's I think we both are kind of lockstep in our agreement there. I think realistically he's probably going to get a max length contract, and he's probably going to get somewhere between eight and a half, nine and a half million. I mean, upper limit, $10 million. Because, I mean, the one guy, if Dylan Larkin wanted to, he could say the one comparable to make over $10 million is Jack Eichel. Because Jack Eichel has only had one season better than uh, Larkin production-wise, and that was only by, like, five points. So, like, you could make an argument with Jack Eichel saying, like, well, Jack Eichel makes $10.5 million, and he was the second overall pick. Yeah. So that argument is there and that you could leverage that, but I don't know if that will work out for them or not. And in the end, I don't really care because I just want him to stay around. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, as, as long as we don't give them, I think I don't like know, 13, 15, 15, like, I'm, yeah. you know what I mean? Like I'm going to be, I'm going to be pretty okay with whatever. Like this is just me. Uh, you know, trying to predict what is going to happen, not necessarily, you know, my limits of what I would give him. I, I, I would, I, I would give him, well, I guess that's a whole different conversation, but uh, you know, it's not too far off from what I, I think he's going to get. I think that's around what he's worth. And uh, looking at all the players that do have contracts over 10 million, I think that's kind of a, a clear, maybe not maybe clear is the wrong word but that's uh as it stands so far a different tier of player a different caliber of player and uh yeah i'm i'm and he could turn into that he's still only 26 like he could still keep taking steps forwards and that's obviously the hope and that that's awesome but um you know we only have what we have to work with so i, I yeah i totally expect him to to be in that you know just under 10 mil range i think 
Well, again, like I was and saying, I'm fine if they give them 10, I really like, I'm not losing any sleep at night. If they go, you know, 10, eight, I'm, I'm chill with that. Well, and like we talked about many times, if it weren't for the fact that he had to have core muscle surgery, he would have busted through his uh, cure high in points. I mean, yep. he was on pace at, before that he sustained that injury around the all-star break. He was like at a point and a half per game. He was crushing it. Yeah. He was. So, I mean, hit a, a full season, a fully healthy lark and, you know, could be close to 90 points, which pumped that $10 million for that's not a bad thing. Like you yeah, can't that, predict that, injuries. That's good value. Injury. That, then you start getting the good <laughs> value. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, any final thoughts, man? Um, go to for the first time in my life. I think I like all four general managers of the city of Detroit. We'll see how long that lasts. Um, we will. So yesterday, yeah. fun fact, little little anecdote before I sign off. I was sitting here at my desk, and I was just editing our episode. I was getting ready to post it up, and didn't touch my mic. The mic fell off my desk, and it's one of those ones that you it's a screw on clamp. Yeah, me too. And it just fell off my desk. Is nope. it fine now? It, yeah, I mean, I just put it back on. Oh. It just it scared me. I, it's it kind of scary. What do you think? Yeah. Do you think it was like a? I don't know. A sign from God? From whatever you believe in, I guess. I don't know. What do, what do you think it's trying to tell me? Give up? No, never give up. Buy a better mic? Maybe. That actually might be it. <laughs> the mic's good. I just had a call. I The technical difficulties I had were not the mic's fault. It was the cheap wires that I bought off Amazon, which I rectified. Maybe it so. was... Uh, I don't know. I have no clue. I'm done trying to... <laughs> yes, I don't want your mic fall. <laughs> All right. We'll be back on Wednesday with a new episode. Same time, same place. It's your team. Every day. Every day.